This is a video you don't want to miss. My almost 24 hours spent traveling with Saudi Airlines had some of the highest highs and lowest lows of any trip I can remember. From illogical processes to inaccurate flight times to the worst airport hotel night of my life to having food poisoning on a 10 hour flight, this trip truly tested my limits. And as you're about to see, even though some parts of the Saudi experience are better than anything I've seen on any other airline in the world, I can't recommend them for a huge variety of reasons. If you're new here, you might think, why listen to me? I'm Nonstop Dan, a half Sweden, half American who has been obsessed with airplanes for as long as I can remember. Over the past eight years, I've been lucky to call reviewing airlines my full-time job, and in that time, I've flown 150 different airlines, always self-funded. So I hope this video helps you with your choices. So another trip starts at Dubai Terminal 1, but today feels extra unique and adventurous because I am flying an airline I have never had a desire to fly. In fact, I think many of you might remember from a few years ago when I said I would refuse to fly this airline. What changed? Well, if you follow me on my other channel, Oscar and Dan, you'll know that Oscar and I traveled to Saudi Arabia last year. And we had a very interesting trip. So if you haven't checked out those vlogs, you should, because there were many highs and lows, but it was overall a fascinating experience. And we shared a little bit more of our rationale behind going there. Still on that trip, I only flew Fly Adil and Fly Nas. So obviously the biggest Saudi airline was still missing. And now I needed to get to Japan. There was no award space on an airline. I hadn't reviewed very recently, so I decided to get creative. And what did I find? A Saudi award space via Delta. And I thought it's 2023, the time has come. So Saudi was my only option and knowing whether or not I should recommend them to you guys is really valuable since they're often by far the cheapest airlines to fly with on various routes nowadays. They've grown so much that they're difficult to ignore and in just a few years Saudi Arabia is aiming to have an even larger super connector called Riyadh Air. I know some of you guys will wonder why I would support Saudi Airlines and I get it. Given airline industry margins and the fact that this was an award ticket, which I'll talk about how I paid at the end, I'd expect the profit Saudi made on my ticket was between 50 and 75 dollars. So without further ado, let's do this. Now, here is my Airbus A330-300, the backbone of Saudi's medium haul fleet. We have an impressive configuration on board with five rows of business class in a 222 configuration. The last two rows on the right side of the cabin are sometimes used for crew rest on longer flights, so they're surrounded by a curtain. All other seats are pretty much created equal apart from row one, which would be the best choice for sleeping since the foot area is larger. Let's hop on board and see how this cabin looks in practice. Although boarding is already in its final stages when I get to the gate, surprisingly, I'm the first business class passenger to board. Today's route will take us from Dubai to Jeddah, departing Departing at 21 hours local time and landing in Jeddah at 23.05 with a flight time of 3 hours and 5 minutes. There I'll have a 9.5 hour layover before continuing to Jakarta the next morning at 8.35, landing at 22.45 after 10 hours and 10 minutes of flying. I'm welcomed on board to some judgy looks from the Saudi purser over my outfit, but to be fair, I'd be judged for this on most European airlines too. The rest of the crew are wonderful, and they offer to take a photo of me with the cabin to myself. If you've watched any airline reviews before, you'll probably recognize this seat. It's the same you'll find on United, and still find on a huge number of airlines, ranging from Qatar Airways to KLM. For long haul, it's an extremely substandard seat, but for a three-hour flight, this is more than satisfactory. The seat sadly has very limited storage, with this awkwardly placed a little bin above your shoulder and unlike some airlines, Saudi has not installed a storage shelf below the entertainment screen on their A330s. The seat also lacks privacy. Still, it lays completely flat. Yes, I'm reclining my bed during boarding and yes, it is embarrassing. The bed is really slim but a lie flat is better than a non-lie flat and again, it's a three hour flight. The armrest can be lowered which makes it a little wider as you can see. On our left side here we have a remote and some USB ports while the charging ports are below the center section. Thank you. 
Now let's get to the most impressive part of the Saudi experience, the pre-departure service. The crew offers me a choice of various juices or a date smoothie and I go for lemonade which is served not only with a hot towel but an entire bowl of nuts. I can't remember ever receiving nuts before takeoff in business class. The crew again are incredible, especially Nisreen from Morocco. The other crew members are from India, Romania and France so quite an interesting mix. Up next, Saudi coffee with dates. What makes Saudi coffee different from Arabic coffee? That it generally contains saffron while Emirati coffee for example mostly does not. Soon enough, we're pushing back and the safety video plays. I'm curious why it features a signer instead of subtitles. Does anyone know the reason for this? Next up, the world's second longest travel prayer plays, only second to what I've experienced on Royal Brunei. We are off with the sweeping views of Dubai as we make our way inland to follow the UAE border all the way to Saudi. Soon after takeoff, it's meal time, and unfortunately, there are no menus on medium or short haul routes. Big note to anyone who likes to drink on board Saudia does not serve any alcohol on any flights regardless of route or class. My enormous vegan meal is served all on one tray, and my goodness, this is not what I'm craving at 10 30 p.m. You see this food? Well, this is the last thing I'll be eating on this trip because as you'll see on my next flight to Jakarta, my in-flight food poisoning nightmare comes true. Until recently, food poisoning would have been the nail in the coffin for the workout routine I've been diligently and proudly following for the past six weeks. As a traveler, consistency seems impossible. Any excuse will stop me. A few days of food poisoning have thrown me off healthy routines completely in the past. That is until I met Devin. He is my very own coach through today's video sponsor, Copilot. When I signed up for Copilot, I was asked a series of questions to find the perfect trainer for me, and Devin is the guy. He has been helping me create completely custom workouts and health plans that he changes based on what I have available at the gym and whatever hotel I'm staying at around the world. I literally chat with him every day, provide feedbacks on the workouts, and ask questions about movements. He gets back to me with instructional videos where he shows me how to correct things. This is no normal exercise app, but it also isn't like having a regular personal trainer. Devin follows me around the world. Most importantly, knowing Devin will check in on me daily is keeping me accountable so that whatever comes up, I finally don't have an excuse to slack for a second more than necessary. I guess this is why Copilot is nine times more successful at helping their clients meet their fitness goals with over 75% of people like you and me sticking to their workouts after a hundred days. That's insane. If you've been waiting to have the discipline and knowledge to reach your fitness goals, give Copilot a try. Click my Copilot link to get a free trial with your own exercise expert fitness and health coach. During the meal, I browse the entertainment system, which has a bare minimum selection for a long haul flight, but it's more than enough for this leg. I'm curious about the Islamic section and try to watch the Umrah instructions to gain some cultural insights, but it's in Arabic without English subtitles, so I switched to Mad Men. I used to watch and love this show as a teen, and I've forgotten how amazing it is, even when censored on board. For example, there's one scene where I think a guy in the office is showing Dawn a picture of a woman, but Saudi has zoomed all the way in on the guy's face to conceal it so the show turns all pixelated. The accompanying headphones are pretty good. Before I know it, I'm getting drowsy, but there is no bedding besides this pillow and also no amenity kit, not that either is necessary for me to fall asleep on this flight. Sadly, I'm woken up a short while after by an announcement that in 30 minutes we'll be near Mecca. I can't fall asleep again after that, and eventually we begin our approach into Jeddah following another announcement about Mecca. Emirates does not wake passengers up with these announcements, but Saudi is obviously appealing to a very different market market segment. One last thing as we approach, there is in-flight Wi-Fi which costs $10 per 50 megabytes. That's insanely pricey, but at least there's unlimited messaging for $2 once you exhaust your 5 free megabytes. Here's the strange thing. We took off from Dubai on time, but it's 11.55 when we pull into our gate, 50 minutes behind schedule, despite no apparent delays or holding for any traffic on approach. This gives me less time to sleep, but don't worry, I won't be getting much sleep anyway, as you're about 
to see. Jeddah's new airport is stunning and seems to be well constructed. The transit experience is pretty smooth with clear signage, no line for transit security, and best of all, direct access to the airport hotel when entering the departure hall. Although I've read about it beforehand, I'm surprised to see it's an air hotel because for some reason, you can't book it online. The prices are quite steep, but it's the only option if you don't want to enter the country and pay a fortune for a tourist visa. The hotel is also a plaza premium lounge, so there are other passengers using this space. I can't get the Wi-Fi here to work on any of my devices though. Meanwhile, the free airport Wi-Fi requires an OTP, and I try it with three different SIMs, one American, one Swedish, and one UAE SIM. None of them receive a code after minutes of waiting, so the airport Wi-Fi seems unusable for most people. Anyway, here is my room. Nice, modern, and clean. Okay, so I made it to the hotel and honestly, one of the best things I found about coming to Saudi is getting to interact with Saudi women because they are generally so friendly and so funny. This woman in the reception was no exception. Oh, reception, exception. So weirdly enough, this hotel cannot be pre-booked even though it's an air hotel, which is an international airport hotel brand. And the weirdest thing is that she said there are no plans for it to be pre-bookable either, which definitely adds an element of stress to the transfer experience. But I can't say this was too bad. I mean, I'm in my room about 15 minutes after landing. Another weird thing is there's no Wi-Fi in the room, only out in the public areas, which uh, I don't know what's up with that. On that note, I'm gonna head to bed. I think I have about six hours of sleep before I get up. And then the nine hour flight over to Southeast Asia. Good night. <sighs> How naive to think I would have a good night's sleep. Okay, so let me tell you what happened last night because uh, yeah, it wasn't a very good night's sleep. Everything was going well. I fell asleep at like 1, 1 15 a.m. Then at 5, 15 a.m. someone starts ringing the doorbell on my room. So I jump out of bed, I look out of the peephole, and the person who was doing it was gone. I already can't see someone. At this point, I go to call the front desk and realize my room phone is completely unplugged and thereby useless. Yikes. So I fall back asleep. I think everything is fine because I have like an hour and a half still to sleep. Then at 5.50, someone is back on bling, 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 bling on the doorbell several times. But not only that, this time they use a key card and unlock and open my door. Thank goodness I locked my door from the inside because they couldn't open it. But at that point, yeah, I'm not falling back asleep, of course. So I lay in bed a bit. I'm angry. And then I get up and think, okay, I might as well get ready for the day. At 6.40, I'm in the shower and the same thing happens again. Someone is ringing on the door and they unlock the door and try to open it while I'm in the shower. Needless to say, not a very good night. At this point, I'm fuming. So I get dressed, pack my stuff and storm to the front desk. Yes, hello, sir. I'm checking out. Thank you. I just want to... Someone rang on my door three times during the night. First at 5, then 5.50, knocking, and even someone tried to open the door to my room with a key, so... Did you request a makeup sir? At 7 o'clock, yeah. I'll check with the housekeeping, sir. Yeah. I'm so sorry about this. I'm <laughs> really sorry. Yeah. I'll take care. It's lucky they were women at the front desk because otherwise I would have requested a refund. But here in Saudi, I'm not going to give them a super tough time. So with that, let's explore the brand new Saudi lounge. Welcome to Al Fursan. This is a truly impressive facility with robots, multiple food and non-alcoholic drink stations, plentiful seating, rest areas, a kid's play area, and more. For some reason, I'm feeling really nauseous, which I blame on the strange night's sleep, so I opt for a little fruit and nothing more. The only drawback of the lounge is that it completely lacks natural light, something that makes no sense in a brand new terminal. I don't have time to stay for long, so I head to the gate. Are you ready to experience Saudi's long-haul product? Stay tuned.
When I get to my gate, I'm greeted by the craziest line. Most of Saudi's passengers to and from Indonesia are traveling to Mecca and Medina, so these flights tend to be full of relatively inexperienced travelers. What's most fascinating is the implications on the onboard product, namely the size of the business class cabin. In fact, there isn't an open business class line, so I approach the gate agent to ask about it and she proceeds, like the Saudi queen she is, to leave her post, escort me down the escalators and open the door to my private jetway. Oh my god, I'm the only passenger in business class today, so I have my very own jetway. They even had to open the doors just for me to be able to walk here. Now, the Saudi 777-300ER comes in a few different configurations, and I'll be honest, I didn't do my research before I booked this. I assumed Saudi had reverse herringbones on all their 777-300s, except maybe those used for Hajj, but it turns out all of Indonesia gets a worse product. So I'm on, without a doubt, the strangest 777 configuration I have ever ever flown. This bad boy has 393 economy seats in a spacious 333 layout and must have quite generous leg room back there too considering there are only two rows of business class. That's right, two rows on a 777-300ER. These seats, it turns out, are almost identical to what I had on the E330 in a 222 layout. Not exactly a great product for a 10-hour flight, but when you have the cabin to yourself, it's hard to complain. I would choose row 1 for additional foot space, but best of all is choosing to have a cabin to yourself, which you deserve. Let's check it out. The first thing I do after boarding is peek into economy before anyone occupies this section. Look spacious and comfy as expected. In business class, my nausea has gone from manageable to increasingly concerning. I'm offered a berry smoothie, which tastes delicious, but I can barely keep even a sip down, and it's served along with this hot towel. That is followed by Arabic coffee, and I accept it even though I know I shouldn't. The two crew members, Abhishek and Utami, are exceptional. True five-star quality. Good morning. Can I some Saudi coffee? Yes, please. Thank you. Enjoy. I think we should take off and leave Saudi before I show you more. Quick note, I'm 99% sure they skipped the safety video on this flight. I highly doubt I could zone out for long enough to not notice it playing. That's a little bit alarming, but I'm not surprised given the attitude of the purser on this flight. More on that later too. After takeoff, my health is deteriorating really quickly. I start feeling extremely nauseous, that type of nausea that consumes you on the verge of vomiting. I spend the next five hours desperately trying not to vomit. I have food poisoning, that is for sure. I sit for hours on end, unmoving to numb my nausea, sweating like crazy and using acupuncture I learned to minimize the risk. I know I should just let it out, but vomiting is one of my biggest nightmares to begin with. I dread it so much, let alone on an airplane. Long story short, I often end up in the hospital when I vomit due to low blood pressure. So yeah, it's best avoided in a situation like this. By some miracle, from one second to another after five hours, the urge suddenly goes away and I feel like I might be able to save this video. So I sit up and head to the lavatory. It's decently clean and spacious, but not exactly the dream place to have food poisoning, that's for sure. Back in my seat, this is the half reclined state where I spent the past five hours. The bed is pretty comfortable and I cannot express how grateful I am to have it in this situation. And I'm also grateful for these individual air vents that help me cool off in my feverish state. The biggest difference between this seat and the A330 is that there's storage below the video monitor, which honestly makes a huge difference, since your storage pretty much increases by 100%. The lovely crew is literally desperate to serve me, and I don't really want to reject them even if I know I'll vomit if I eat anything. Here is the in-flight menu. Not only is it extensive, but I love the emphasis on Saudi cuisine. Saudi also has Dine on Demand, which is one of my favorite business class features since you can eat whenever you want. At this point, I do something I usually never do. I tell the chef Abhishek I'm making a video and ask if he wouldn't mind bringing me some food just so he doesn't get offended if I don't eat it. I don't want to tell him I have food poisoning because I don't want to freak anyone out. He says, you know what? Let me show you anything you want. It'll all get thrown out after landing anyway. So my food presentation begins. While I wait for the feast for the eyes to begin, I check out the gorgeous amenity kit. This must be one of the nicest looking business class amenity kits I've ever seen. And the contents are pretty good too. I especially love the eye mask. 
I also take this moment while I'm waiting to connect to the Wi-Fi, since I'd received a code beforehand over email with a Wi-Fi voucher for this flight. Unfortunately, the Wi-Fi was so slow, it was barely usable even for text messages, and my data ended up running out super fast. Now it's uh, breakfast time? We start with this gorgeous Saudi breakfast plate. It's all presented on a tray, I think due to the seat type, unfortunately, but my goodness, I have half a spoon of this fool and it's absolutely delicious. The same goes for the falafel. As I sit there and look at my food like a psychopath, the sun sets outside over the Nicobar Islands. Next up, Abhishek brings out the granola with dairy Greek yogurt. I try a tiny bit of the granola with one berry and it's also absolutely delicious. Let's keep it rolling here, folks. The superfood salad from the menu. This is something I wish every airline had on board instead of terribly unhealthy food that doesn't help with jet lag or feeling well when you land. Last but not least, my pre-ordered vegan breakfast, which is a vegetable patty and some baked beans. The portion is laughably small, but hey, it's not like there isn't enough food on board as the only passenger. Throughout the time I'm awake, there are multiple men who come to sit in the business class seats on the other side of the cabin, taking off their shoes and socks and starting to watch movies and shows. The crew serves them food and generally seems to take care of them, and only prior to landing do I realize that these are the pilots who are sitting in the cabin rather than using the crew rest area on their breaks. It's also fascinating to see that every single time I go to the alley after sunset, there are crew preying on prayer mats wearing regular clothes, not uniform, something I've certainly never seen on any other Middle Eastern airline before. Just like that, we land in Jakarta and I head to my hotel for the night. Oh, I feel terrible. I, okay. I am so ready for bed. I'm here at the Anara Airport Hotel in Jakarta. I am shook because it took me about 20 minutes to get from the plane to the hotel. That includes buying a visa on arrival, doing immigration, customs, buying a Pakari sweat to rehydrate myself, and checking in and walking here. So. I'm just so happy. Oh my gosh, they have a, what is this? Jap Japanese toilet? Oh, almost. My God, there's no place like Southeast Asia. What do I think of Saudia? They have some highs, most notably the crew, and some lows, most notably all the unusual things you don't see on any other airlines, which makes the whole onboard environment a little uncomfortable. The pursers on both my flights just had outright unwelcoming vibes, which made me feel really bad for the rest of the crews. Just an example, I specifically asked Abhishek for his and his colleague's full name, so I can submit compliments to the airline. The purser then comes by to hand me the note, not Abhishek, with the purser's name written at the top so I can submit compliments about him. The delusion, honey. I do think Saudi is an interesting option, definitely 70,000 Delta Sky miles well spent, and I want to avoid flying them again, but I don't want to stay overnight in Jeddah, and to be honest, although I've traveled quite extensively in Saudi and they've started modernizing, it'll take a whole lot more progress for me to feel comfortable there even during transit. Needless to say, I'm very excited to be heading to Japan, recover from my food poisoning, and get back into the gym with Devin by my side via my phone. Again, click my co-pilot link at the top of the description to get a free trial with your own expert fitness and health coach. I'll see you all in a new video soon, I promise, and until then, fly safe guys.